Elevate your life with this episode of Lifestyle and Success with Dr. S. You are listening to Lifestyle and Success with Dr. S, a talk show to help you rise in business success while designing a life that you don't need a vacation from. To subscribe to the show and never miss a beat, head to Lifestyle and Success with DRS.com. Today's episode is coming up next. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show today. So today I'm so excited to have Alyssa Kerbel joining us. She is a multi-passionate lifelong entrepreneur, and she is the founder of Mini Mioch. I'm really excited to have her talk about her brand and her business. She's been featured on the Profit Magazine's list of Canada's top 100 female entrepreneurs. She has so much to share, and she's also been on the Globe and Mail list of the top 400 fastest growing companies in Canada. Alyssa, I'm so happy you joined us. I can't wait to hear more about your business. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you today and really appreciate the invite. Yes, yes. So listen, you have so much to to share, sister, about growing an ethical brand, an ethical business, being in the fashion industry. How did you get started with this work? Well, uh, probably like a lot of other entrepreneurs out there and listening, perhaps, um, I started it as a side hustle, like many of us do, right? So uh, at the time, I, I, as you mentioned, I've been an entrepreneur pretty much my entire life, my entire adult life, my career. Um, I guess that's partly because I love to create my own path. I also don't love people telling me what to do. I've always struggled with that. So um, I, my first business that I started in my 20s was actually a wholesale fashion business where I had an agency and a showroom and I was kind of like a middleman. So I would sell different adult brands of clothing. I would represent different brands of clothing and sell them to retailers. So it was business to business sales, which is really my background. Um, and I ran that business for many years um, and then I had, a baby um, about five years into having that business I had a baby and a little girl and um, at the time after I had her uh, I took a little bit of time off as many people you know who are many women who are entrepreneurs know when you're an entrepreneur and you're running a business you know depending on your situation you often do not really have much of a mat leave you don't get a lot of time off you kind of have to jump back in on some level and and that was the situation with me although i did have s- some people working with me at the time so i did have a little bit of a a break so to speak um a short break where i was able to spend time with my daughter um and be kind of off or just not working as much and during that time um i you know I was looking for the type of clothing that I wanted to dress her in, which was really just about having clothing that was like simple and really soft and comfortable. Um, At the time with my agency, I was selling one of the brands that I was representing and selling was a brand that had um, sustainable fabric. So they were using organic cotton, they were using bamboo and modal. um, And that was really new and different because this was 14 years ago now. So well, Mm -hmm. almost 15 years ago. So this was like kind of ahead of whenever like anything was organic or sustainable, like this was at the forefront of it. And I was selling this brand and and my customers, my clients, the, the stores that I was selling to were really interested in that that idea of sustainable fabrics. And so I thought, you know, it didn't really exist much at the time on the baby market. And I couldn't really find, you know, what it was that I wanted to dress my daughter in. And so I decided to just see if I could create um, this type of clothing. Um, and it was interesting because, you know, at the time I, I decided, you know, I kind of went back to like, what are my values and what do I care about as a parent, as a mother, um, as an entrepreneur, and how could I build something around those values and what I really care about? And so I kind of, without necessarily being so intentional about it, I I just sort of did it in that way. So for me, that was like, I wanted to know where the stuff was made and I wanted it ideally to be made locally if I could make that work. Um, I loved the idea of making it with sustainable fabrics. And that to me was also going to give the brand a bit of a point of difference because there really wasn't much on the market. Um, I love the idea of creating like what I refer to as gender neutral clothing for for babies because I was like, 
a t-shirt is a t-shirt and a pant is a pant and a beanie is a beanie. And I just want like gender neutral colors and super soft fabrics. Mm. And, and that has become like all of those things, interestingly, have become more and more important to people along the journey. So yeah. where things are made and how things are made um, has become really important. Doing things in a sustainable and environmentally conscious way has become really important. And having kids just be kids, like, you know, buying something and then, you know, putting it on your son. And then if you have a girl next, you put it on your girl. You don't just yeah. like toss it, right? Like the idea is like longevity and, you know, consciousness around what we're buying and how we're buying things and what, you know, what ultimately we're also teaching our kids um, mm. about those values. And so that, that was kind of how I thought about it was like, mm -hmm. okay, I want to create this thing. I want to create it with these values in mind. And um, yeah, so I just kind of started it as a side hustle while I was continuing to run my agency business, which was really like my, my main thing. And I didn't really have the intention of, um, of leaving that main thing. And in fact, I didn't for seven years. <laughs> I mm. ran both businesses for seven years. Like I continued to have my agency while I built Mini Miosh. Um, and, you know, the apparel business and the business, this business that I'm in is very different. Um, it does require it's a very different type of business and it does require a lot more capital to build than something like an agency where you don't carry inventory and you don't have, um, you know, accounts receivable, accounts payable, all these different ins and outs. So for me, it took me quite a while to build the business to a point where I could consider having it be something that I could like actually live off of and have be, be my main thing without it, um, having to curb my lifestyle too much. Like I didn't mm -hmm. want to give up my life. Yeah. Thing. And I wanted okay. to continue to be able to travel and go out to dinner and do the things that I love. And so it took me, it took me a long time. Um, and in fact, I didn't pay myself out of this business out of mini Miyash. I just continued to reinvest and reinvest and reinvest while I was building it for like five years. Mm. Um, and then finally got to a point where I recognized that, um, I think sometimes we kind of have to hit these breaking points, or at least this has been my experience along the way of hitting certain breaking points where I'm like, this isn't working for me anymore. This isn't working for my life anymore. This isn't serving me anymore. I need to, I need to make a change. And I hit that point. Um, I feel like maybe five, six years ago and decided to sell my agency business so that I could jump full time into mini Miosh and just building that. And so I did, I, I sold that business and exited. Mm -hmm. And so for the last sort of, um, well, in total, it's been about 14 years. So I guess it's been about six or seven years since I sold that business and have been, um, you know, going along the entrepreneurial roller coaster of building mm -hmm. this business ever since. And so yeah. that's kind of how it has unfolded. I love that. And can you just tell the audience really quickly what sustainable fabric means? Because I'm sure that's a new terminology for some people. What do you mean by that? So for us, we use GOT certified, so GOTS certified organic cotton, which essentially just means that our cotton is grown without the use of pesticides and chemicals. Um, so that's where our, we import the yarn, the GOTS yarn into Toronto. And then we actually knit we do everything locally in Toronto with our brand. So we knit all of our fabrics locally here in Toronto to our specifications. So we, we use all organic cotton and um, well, primarily we use a little bit of bamboo, but primarily about 95% of our brand is used is, is produced with organic cotton. So we will produce Jersey or French Terry or fleece depending on the style. Um, but we use, um, yeah, organic cotton yarn to create the fabrics. All of our fabrics are dyed, um, and finished locally using low impact, non-toxic dyes. So that's also happens locally. And then the fabrics are sent to our local factories, which are also in Toronto and they cut and finish and sew everything um, locally. So we do everything basically within about 25, 30 minutes from where I'm doing this interview in downtown Toronto. Yes, I love that. So it's local, it's all the things, local, organic. I mean, were you always involved in this movement of sustainability or is this new? Like, what did you think you'd be doing when you grew up? 
Yeah, no, I I I never really was um, thinking about this growing up. Although when I was growing up, um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. But um, I always loved fashion. My mom used to joke that I used to change outfits like six or seven times a day. Like I just loved clothes. Um, and in fact, I grew up in a, a small town uh, near Toronto. And one of my favorite things to do growing up was to come to Toronto and visit my grandparents. And my mom would take me to this store in Toronto that doesn't exist anymore but it was this store that had all these amazing colors of like track suits and and it was like sweatshirts and sweat tops um, and bottoms that matched and I used to love going there and picking like I've just always been obsessed with basics honestly like I've always just loved comfy clothes you know soft fabrics clothes that feel good on um clothes that make you feel at home in your body. And I guess, you know, when my daughter was born, that's why I wanted to create this type of clothing because, you know, when you have a newborn baby and they have sensitive skin and they can't talk to you, like you just want to know that they feel good. Yeah. You know, like you just want to know that they feel like good in their skin and good in their body and that what you're putting on them feels good and it's good for them. And that's really what I cared about. And I felt like I'm probably not alone in caring about that. Mm. So when you decided to take that passion and turn it into a real life business that supported you, that employed people, um, I mean, I'm sure that that was a big task in itself, but I'm wondering what other hurdles did you experience outside of like having this grandiose idea that you probably or maybe weren't quite sure how to make it a reality? What what hurdles exposed themselves in that building process? <laughs> So many hurdles, so many <laughs> hurdles. You're like everything. <laughs> oh my God. Like I, I'm like, which hurdle? Like so many hurdles. I mean, there was hurdles right out of the gate because when you're doing things, um, you know, for the first time, you're just learning on the fly with everything. So as a, as a small example, um, our first production run that we ever did, um, we, we did it in such a way it's called garment dye. So garment dye is where you produce the, the actual garment and then the, the dye house dyes the finished product. So that's one way to do it. The other way is to dye the fabric, the big rolls of fabric that's called piece dyeing. But our first production run, we did garment dye and we produced onesies, you know, like the onesies that babies wear that have like the snaps in the crotch. Mm -hmm. And we did three different styles of onesies, a tank, a short sleeve and a long sleeve onesie. And, um, when they dyed them, they, they dyed them with all of the snaps done up. And so the torquing and the pulling and the machine as it was, you know, doing the dye process ended up, you know, producing what and we what we ended up getting was all of the onesies had rips in the crotch where the snaps were oh and so none of them were saleable and that was like I put all my money basically into producing this first run like whatever money I had which was nothing basically because yeah. I just bootstrapped it you know from the beginning didn't I just took a little bit of savings and was like oh I'll just start this little side hustle with this little bit of money so you know that was like a big hurdle right out of the gate was that I had all of this product that I couldn't sell um, and had to reproduce. Um, so like, you know, right away there was a big hurdle. And then later as I started to figure things out and I was, you know, growing the business and I was trying to figure out how to continue to grow the business, um, you know, I, I did a lot of things to grow it, which were in, in in retrospect, they were the right things. I um, but they did they did require a lot of money, um, which I didn't really have. And so I found myself at a certain point in the business um, with a lot of debt. And I like I said, I had bootstrapped this business, and um, I really didn't want to bring in outside investment and financials. You know, I, that was not really of interest to me because I I really was worried that I would have a situation where other people are now dictating my future and dictating how I run my business. And that was just not of interest to me. And so, um, you know, I was really anti getting outside financial support. Um, but I did end up in a lot of debt. And so, you know, that was a big learning for me in terms of what reaching out for support, reaching out for help. I think a lot of entrepreneurs get into financial situations and feel a lot of shame and a lot of, you know, fear around what it means and 
they feel very alone in it. And so a big lesson for me in that was like, you're not alone in it. And, and people have been there and there's always help. And so, you know, just thinking like, who do I know that could help me? And it ended up being a, a, a close family friend who is really just well-versed in finance. So I reached out and was like, here's the situation. Here's what I've done. You know, here's mm-hmm. what I've done. And I, I'm just like, I kind of have a plan, but I don't really know if my plan makes sense. Like I've never done this before. I'm not a person who's well-versed in finance. Like I need to know if I'm on the right path is basically mm-hmm. what I need to know. And, you know, that was somebody who could look at it with a level of expertise that I didn't have and be able to see and look at the numbers and be like, you're on the right path, but I think you need to do this, or I think you need to do that, or I think I would suggest you look at this and make these changes. And in the end, I made those the changes that they suggested to the business, um, mm-hmm. some of which were, you know, significant. Um, and as a result of making those changes, I actually ended up paying off the debt that I had within a year and then was wow. became profitable. So it was just a really interesting experience in terms of reaching out for help. Yes. And how many years in was that when you actually broke that barrier? Um, I'm going to say it was like three, four, four years, maybe in. Wow. So, so like, helpful. Yeah. yeah that's going to be I so actually, helpful for someone. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I had launched the brand as a wholesale brand. So selling to stores, that's how I launched it. And then I had added e-commerce and then uh, within two years, we opened a retail location in downtown Toronto. And then within two years of that, I opened a second retail location. So I had invested a lot in growing the brand and I was just like, I don't know if how I've set this all up and it, you know, we were selling a lot, but it just because you're selling a lot doesn't mean you're making money. Yes. <laughs> you, yes. That, and that a lot of entrepreneurs like we chase growth and we chase the top line without often looking at what that growth is costing us yes and often it's not just the money it's costing us a lot of other things in life Mm. (laughs) Um, it's something to be I think aware of as we chase that you know that constant growth goal that we often are always working towards as entrepreneurs Um, and just having that check of like, does this actually make sense both financially and for my life Mm. and for, you know, what I really want from this thing. Mm. Um, Because I think chasing growth for the sake of growth can lead us down a path that doesn't always serve us. Ah, Amen. Amen. You guys write that down. Alyssa, I mean, we're going to go a lot deeper into your brand and your business, but I really want to focus a little bit more on this space where you broke profit because I'm wondering what made you keep going. You know, it must have been so easy or you may have even thought about it at that time where you had the debt piling up and you may have thought, you know what, I should just call it quits. Like there's not going to be any way out of this. I had a good run. It's year three. It's year four. I can say that I did this. I gave myself a shot. I'm going to call it quits now. But instead, you got professional support, help, feedback, guidance, and you kept pressing on. Why? Honestly, it's the feedback from the customers. If I wasn't selling it, if I wasn't hearing from people that they loved it and that they like, you know wanted to dress their kids in it. They were, it was their go-to baby gift. Like when you get that kind of positive feedback from people about what you're creating Mm -hmm. and what you're putting out into the world, that fuels you. Yeah. That fuels you like that. That feels good beyond anything. Right. So if you are like, I'm, I'm a realist to a certain extent. If something is really not working and I feel like I am just banging my head against a wall for the sake of it, you know, there's that expression like failure is not an option. Mm -hmm. I used to say that all the time. You know what? Failure is an option. Failure Mm -hmm. is an option. Like, and I don't even think about it as failure. I think about it like I tried something. It wasn't the right thing. It didn't work out as planned. I learned a ton. I'm moving on. I'm doing something else. It's not failure. It's learning. Mm -hmm. But there is that, you know, when do you call it kind of thing. And I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to be realistic 
you have to be able to look at things realistically, get that outside support if you're not sure. Because the last thing you want to do is lose your house or your life or whatever it is at the cost of this thing that you're trying to make work no matter what, you know? So mm. you really, you know, I think that keeping going was a combination of like knowing that I had something special that people were wanting and liking, like getting that feedback and just knowing it intuitively. And then having somebody say, this can work, you need to make some changes. And those changes, don't get me wrong, were not easy changes to make. I honestly, I don't know if I would have made those changes had I not seeked that outside counsel um, of somebody saying, if you don't do this, you're probably not going to have a business. Mm. Mm -hmm. sometimes you need to have that feedback right so that's where it's like getting feedback sometimes from somebody you trust that you know has your best interest and then the other part of it is like getting the feedback is really can be really helpful but one of the things that I've learned over my years of doing this is don't take other people's advice and feedback for 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 what it is without that internal check-in mm. at the end of the day you know I think we often are like looking for advice and we're looking for people to validate what we're doing or whatever at the end of the day listen to the advice you know take stock of what people maybe are thinking or saying it's great to do that and especially if it's people you trust that maybe have more experience or knowledge in a certain area but mm. I think we often you know question and doubt what we know to be true and we actually know so much more than we think we do and it's so important to to listen and then to check in and then to listen and then to check in like does this feel right to me do i agree with this does Mm -hmm. this feel like the path for me um what do i really know and that's been a learning for me because i would say anytime i've not done the check-in or i've not listen to myself when I've done the check-in, it's where things have gone off the rails. And to imagine that that one kind of turning point got you to where you are today, it's just remarkable to think about. I mean, you have hit the top 100 female entrepreneurs list, you're on the fastest growing companies list, you have so many followers on social media, and I guess if I were in your shoes, I would I would be pretty damn happy every day. But I'm wondering what what's been your greatest win, like of all of those things and more. What what are you most proud of? I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to build this. What I feel is a very beautiful, values driven, purposeful business, um, and I've been able to do it all of these years for the most part, like over the last many years in a profitable way and in a way that I haven't had to compromise what I care about. Um, And I haven't compromised what I care about through this journey. Um, And I'm, I feel really proud of that and good about that. Um, And another part of it is that as the business has grown and as we've had success, um, I've really been looking at like, how can I use this business as a catalyst for good in the world? So over the past couple of years, we've launched, I mean, we've always done a lot of give back um, and a lot of different work in the community. Um, We launched a particular initiative that I was really proud of this last year called Kind Human Club, which is just really about spreading um, kindness in the world and, you know, recognizing that kindness is like such a powerful thing in our world today and so needed and especially you know um bringing up kind humans kind of conscious happy humans is kind of the goal and how do we how do we do that um collectively um so you know creating these sort of byproducts of this business has felt really good and and been a win and then you know the people i'm surrounded with my team and finding people who honestly like care about my business like I care about my business who are invested in the success of this brand and this company who believe in what we're doing who believe in why we're doing it that's an amazing thing Mm -hmm. so lots of lots of good 
Lots of great wins. Well, darling, we're going to jump in and dive a little bit deeper into your brand and your business, because I know there's a lot of listeners out there who are like, I want an ethical business. Like, I want to be able to not have to jeopardize my values and be able to put people over profit, but still make something and design something and run something that's profitable. And so I'd love to know what kind of tips might you have for someone who's still in their nine to five? They have a vision for building something that does good in the world, but they just don't know how to actualize it. What would you say to those folks? Um, well, I think my own experience has been, um, so I mentioned at the beginning or earlier on in the conversation that I started off my brand and my business in the wholesale space. So selling directly to stores, which was my background with my agency. That was what I knew. So that's how I started it. Um, but I quickly learned in, in doing it that way that there was not enough margin to create something in an ethical way in locally sustainably doing it the way I wanted to do it. And, you know, in the children's wear market, like work probably considered like on the more premium side in terms of price point. But there is a threshold for me in terms of what people are willing to spend and pay on baby and kids wear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, you know, psychologically thinking about price points, where you want to be in the market, you know, what your customer, you know, customers, community is they're willing to pay more for something, especially now as, as people are more conscious and mindful people are willing to spend more on a better product or something that is sustainable or doing good in the world. But there is a threshold typically to how much more they will be mm. willing to pay. And so um, that that part of that difficult decision and part of the, the process around making some of those changes when I did kind of shift and pivot or whatever you want to call it was just recognizing that wholesale model doesn't work for my type of business. I have to go direct to the consumer to make the margin that I need to be making to be able to do it the way that I want to do it. Mm. So there's certain ways of thinking about your business. So it's like, you know, you might want to create something and you might want to create it in a certain way. And at the end of the day, to be profitable, you have to look at your margins, your markup. How much do you, can you make on each piece? And is that going to cover your expenses and then some and if it's not then you're you're not you're not going to be probably successful you're going to be losing money which was what was happening to me um so that the change there was really about what's the business model that can work for the type of business i want to have is there a business model that can work and what does that look like and nowadays in the the world of e-commerce and the world of direct to consumer um it's a lot it's a lot easier and harder, I should say. It's easier to, you know, create a product and to get it in front of people with social media and, you know, with with a brand story and all of those things. It also is more competitive and there is more noise and more on the market. So it's easier and harder, but it is totally possible. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that I think was important in your journey, at least that I picked up on too, was this whole idea of knowing when to pull in a lifeline, you know, knowing when to call in someone that can really help to steer and guide you. And I'm wondering what other experts have you been able to consult with as you've grown your brand and how can folks who are listening that want to build a business or a brand tap into experts in their areas? Do you have any hacks for them? So probably one of my biggest, um, you know, I wouldn't even call it a hack, but one of the things that I always recommend to other entrepreneurs that has been so instrumental in my own journey is um, the idea of a mastermind group. So if you don't know kind of what a mastermind group is, it's a group um, and there are different formats for, for masterminds, but it's typically, let's say, a group of sort of you know, six people, seven people, somewhere in and around there um, that meet all, all entrepreneurs kind of, they don't have to be in the same industry necessarily, but maybe similar industries or there's some crossover. Um, typically you want to have people who are kind of at your level or beyond. So you wouldn't want to have like somebody who's like really, really, be, you know, running like million, multi-million dollar business with a upstart, like they're not going to get the value. But if you find people who are kind of at around your level um, and you can create this group, um, it's essentially like 
the most amazing support group. And, you know, the reality is when you're doing this and you're building a business and you are creating your own path, it is, it can be very lonely. It can be very isolating. It can be super stressful. It can be very, and, and I'm not saying this all to be like, oh, you shouldn't do it. It's just like, it is the reality of being yeah. an entrepreneur. Yeah. And the best way to combat that is to surround yourself with people who get it. Mm -hmm. Those are your people. They're your people who you can be real with and honest with and who you can share what you're going through, whether that's an HR issue or a legal issue. You can share resources. You can share information like, oh, my God, I can't even tell you. I mean, I started a group many years ago myself. So you can create your own group for free. It doesn't cost anything. You can just kind of think about who might I know in my network or who might I know that might know people. So I just started out by reaching out to like one good friend that I had that's also an entrepreneur. And I said, I want to start this mastermind group. Here's what it is. Here's why I want to do it. What do you think? Would you do it with me? And she said, yes. And then we kind of just together brainstormed who else could we ask? And there are specific, there's actually PDFs, like you can look up um, like Jack Canfield, the guy who wrote like the success principles and chicken soup books and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. he, I actually used his PDF. Like it was like, he has a PDF that's like how to create a mastermind group. Mm -hmm. And I just like used his PDF um, and put, it sort of just has like a template for how to create a group. Um, but I started to do that and we would meet monthly and, you know, that was hugely instrumental, like probably more so I, I hadn't, I did I never really had specific mentors or coaches. And that, that would have been really helpful, to be honest, if I had found the right mentor, the right, you know, coach along the way, I just never really found that for myself. But mm -hmm. having this mastermind group of other people who were going through similar things, who were also building businesses, who we could talk through problems with, who we could share wins with, that was hugely instrumental. And I'm still part of, I have a new group. I ran that group for about three, three year and a half years. And then sometimes they run their course. And then I actually joined a new group um, that I've been a part of now for like about two and a half years, maybe two, just over two years. And mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's, it's really, really amazing when you find the right people and you surround and I'm surrounded by so many other w amazing women entrepreneurs who I can reach out to for support like that's the thing like you need to find your people Alyssa this has been so helpful do you have any parting advice for those folks out there who are on their way to creating a business that is ethical that is exciting that gives back to the world and that is also profitable any things that you've experienced that you'd like to kind of share one last time to the audience that may be listening for some tips. Um, you know what? Honestly, I I think if I could give myself, my younger self, my myself 14 years ago advice, it would be to, you know, continually check in with yourself. Like continually check in with yourself and get clarity with yourself about what you're trying to create, why you're trying to create it. What is it that's driving you to create this thing? What does success look like to you not just success in your business but success in your life mm -hmm. what is the ideal scenario and you know to to that that's sort of the north star i think um i think when i was starting my business i was so driven to succeed and i was driven to build this thing and i was driven to create this brand and i have it's amazing but i'm at a point now where i'm like okay what do i really want and you know i think that that's something that i've been focused on more recently in my career and in my business yeah. um is just taking a beat to actually check in with myself to my inner knowing and be like, does this feel right? Does Is this making me happy? Does this feel good? Or am I just doing it because I think I should, or I, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever it is. Because I think, you know, when we're making big decisions and we're trying to figure things out along the way, um, you can, there's a lot of noise and a lot of things that can weigh into those big decisions. And the more that you can take a beat and check in with what you really want, what you care about, what you want for your life and business, the more success you will ultimately have. 
Alyssa, how can our audience find and support you? Please drop your links below because I know you're going to have a lot of followers after this talk show. Uh, well, my the website for the brand is called, it's Mini Miosh, um, the word mini, and then M-I-O-C-H-E dot com. I'm sure it's linked somewhere here as well. Um, it's called Mini Miosh dot com, and we do infant and kids clothes from zero to 12. And then actually, we just launched our first women's collection last week. So we had so many people asking for so long for um, adult versions of what we've been making for over a decade now. So we, we launched um, a small capsule collection last week called M and West. So that's now also available through the Mini Miosh website. They're, they're linked together. Um, so you can check out the product there. And then, you know, our Instagram is Mini Miosh, at Mini Miosh. My personal Instagram is Alyssa Kerbel and you can find me on LinkedIn. I always love hearing from other entrepreneurs. I'm always like, so inspired to see what other people are doing and um, I know that it can be lonely so um, I'm happy to support others in any way that I can on their own entrepreneurial journey. Alyssa Kerbel, thanks so much for coming on the show and I can't wait to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation and hopefully it was helpful for people who are listening. Oh, I'm quite sure it was. <laughs> awesome. Bye. You are listening to Lifestyle and Success with Dr. S, a talk show to help you rise in business success while designing a life that you don't need a vacation from. To subscribe to the show and never miss a beat, head to Lifestyle and Success with DRS.com.